Hey readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're listening to Fictitious, a podcast about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. In this episode, I'm joined by S.A. Chakraborty, author of the Davidbud Trilogy, which includes her acclaimed debut novel, The City of Brass, and its sequel, The Kingdom of Copper, which is available January 22nd. It's a lushly written, emotionally complex fantasy series with a fascinating Middle East-inspired mythology. Shannon, welcome to Fictitious. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to have you on here. I think I've seen so much talk about these novels you know, over like the last year, and so I'm excited to get you on the show and explore this. It's really fascinating in the, uh, the, you know, the world of fiction, especially in fantasy now, that we are seeing a lot more Middle Eastern or Southeastern influence uh, on fantasy and seeing some, some new voices coming in, taking us to radically different, not Eurocentric fantasy story worlds that are so prevalent. And the David Bud trilogy so far has really provided this intensely beautiful, interesting, diverse world. And your prose, to say it's sparkling, I feel like it's like such a cliche, but you really do have this kind of opulent sense of discovery as your world rolls out. Can you tell us more about the David Bud trilogy? What is this story about? The David Bod trilogy basically starts out with a young woman from Cairo from living the 18th century, and she's pulled into this magical world she never believed existed, the, the world that, you know, you hear stories about when you're a little kid, and she finds it's not so magical, um, and a lot of its politics are chaotic, and they involve her um, in all parts, and she tries to make her way in it. Well, I think it was really interesting as I got into this to discover that you know, I, I was aware of Nari, the first like sort of POV character, you know, through the descriptions of the novel. Um, but what I was really surprised to find was how quickly we would get this other character named Ali, who is a jinn and lives in a society made up of entirely either pure-blooded or mixed-blooded jinn. So they're they're not human, although they oper- you know, operate in human form. And you lay out over time exactly why that is and how they come to be living in sort of like a mortal form in this world, despite not being human. And I thought that was a really fascinating angle to like spend a lot of your time purely with like these non-human characters and seeing that political like world and stuff. So looking at that balance between the human world and then so much in the jinn world how do you approach telling that kind of story where the characters are, are a lot of them aren't human and making them approachable and making that world a parallel to ours but also showing dissimilarities well i think a lot of that is rooted into how i started writing the story because i started my background my academic background is in medieval islamic studies and i wanted to go the the graduate school route and become a professor of history and all these things. And at the time that I was wanted to go back to graduate school, I couldn't for the economy crashed. It was 2008. So I started working, but I still had this great love for medieval history. And I had all of these books I was always reading. It was a hobby to me in many ways. And I wanted to kind of keep that fresh in my mind. I liked science fiction and fantasy. I liked, you know, the history of ninth century Baghdad. So I just combined them. So I made up this world that was parallel to our world, working with very traditional jinn mythology. In Islam, we don't have the idea that it's this big blue Disney guy. Um, We have the idea that the jinn exist invisible alongside us. They have their own societies, their own ways of living, and it's just hidden to our eye. And they have magic and they live for all these centuries. And I always thought that was a fascinating concept. We had these long lived magical beings just kind of watching over us and being, ah, the British have fallen or ah, the Egyptians have risen. And I wanted to kind of recreate that world that was in interactions with the human world so that, you know, the jinn might say, oh, I like they have the ziggurats over here. Let's bring them over and add magic. Let's take the court system of, you know, the Zanzibari Sultanate and twist it to our own means. They lived throughout the centuries, picking up bits of human history and human culture and things that worked for them and sort of twisting it to their own ends and adding magic So by the time I had this world built, the human characters, the magical characters were so intertwined. I didn't really think necessarily, oh, how would this magical character react? You know, especially Ali and Nahri are young. I thought, how would I react? How would someone in this position react? And maybe adding, thinking more about the political consequences of and family consequences that would hit them rather than sort of this supernatural, unearthly aspect. 
it's interesting that you kind of have like the Jin are sort of culturally appropriation based because the, you have these six di- different factions of them and some of them are completely like isolationist into their world and other ones, I don't want to say idolize the humans, but identify with them in a much greater way and have adapted more of their culture. And I, like you, you talked about there, like when Nari first sees the city of brass, sees David, but that there are these buildings that look familiar and these things that are like wildly different, like beyond her dreams but they're all kind of meshed together this slam bang of of culture together and i thought that was a really interesting concept what kind of research did you do to kind of put all that together um well even say on the the first question because i wanted to build on that that was very intentional um because i wanted to really examine this race of beings that in many ways looks down upon humans yet they still ache for aspects of their culture and their creations that they they don't have that as much as they can they have this sort of tortured relationship with humanity. Suleiman curses them, changes their form. They're supposed to stay away, yet they can't. I wanted to really examine the different ways all of them interact with that, that some of the groups who look down on them will also, you know, quietly take their writing system. So, like, uh, to kind of have a different relationship with, and I think that says a lot about how certain groups look down upon other groups and then quietly take all their historical inspiration. So I really wanted to play with that. And the research was just really building on what I had done in school and what I liked reading. In particular, I mean, people will often think, oh, your your specialty must have been Egypt. Um, it wasn't. I really liked the era of the Abbasid Caliphate, which is sort of what we call often the glory age of Islam between sort of the 8th centuries and the 12th centuries, centering on Baghdad and then Persia, the Indian Ocean world, the greater, you know, Arabia and the rest of the Middle East and North Africa. And that was something I just loved reading about. I loved reading about the politics of the age. I mean, it was a wild age in arts and culture. And I mean, some of the political figures are straight out of like central casting for like, you know, (laughs) even royals, unfortunately, but it's just a great time of all these different groups living together, different religions, different cultural groups, and and working and trading and warring. And I just really liked that period. So I was always reading about it. I would be reading about, you know, courtesans in the ninth century court, and a funny line or something witty would catch me, and it would just sort of bring that period alive. I tried to recapture much of that sense, that as much as Nahri is a woman from 18th century Egypt, it's a portal fantasy in the fact that she's taken to this magical world that it could have existed centuries earlier, um, and that was built from a lot of that. So the research, fortunately, has is really fun, because whenever I need to check something new, I'm, I'm lucky in the fact that I usually have a book for it or I kind of know where to turn. It's funny because as much as fantasy this is the stereotypical, oh, medieval Europe, I could not write a book <laughs> in medieval Europe if you paid me because I have no idea what happened. <laughs> but I was fortunate in the fact that a lot of this was fairly easy to, to come by. As you were informing the work with the research, the research was informing the work to come. Were there particular themes that were like really kind of arising is that you found that like made it easy to inject them into the story or things that you you really felt that you wanted to say along with the narrative? I don't think I wrote a lot of this thinking, oh, I want to say this. I think and I don't think a lot of writers do. I think we we explore story. And as you're going along with the plot, you tend to kind of realize, oh, I say a lot about family or, oh, I say a lot about religion. And I think that was how it was here. Um, one thing I did want to explore is, and this is just something I've always been fascinated by in, in in sort of royal families, is just the idea that it's a family. I mean, how does it, we have so many instances in history where you see brothers going to war against each other, cousins going to war against each other, sons plotting the assassination of their fathers. And I really wanted to delve at what causes that to happen? You love your family. You can I, you can look in, in certain aspects of history. You know, people struggle with this. They say, oh, I don't want to execute my brother, even though he tried to overthrow me. Let's just put his eyes out, maybe as punishment. Um, and wow. I really wanted, well, yeah, <laughs> not much better, but I, but I really wanted to pull into that of like, how do you grow up together and have sibling love and rivalry? And then also, how does politics pull into that of not only this personal gain, I want the throne, I want the riches and all the success that comes with it. But particularly in this novel, I wanted to talk about um, when it's not just power, but faith that pulls your family apart. When I wrote the character of Ali, um, I really wanted to write this you know, devout Muslim man who in many ways, he sees an injustice and his faith is calling for him to correct it. 
but it's it means he has to go against his own family and that's you know an anathema to him so kind of working with those things and as much as I can look back now and say oh those are the themes of the novel when I was writing it I didn't really think too much of that it came out after Ali is for me like the most fascinating character of the novel and like you said for for Nari like that's more of like a, you know you said portal fantasy she's the you know that person coming from sort of like rag to riches kind of kind of situation Ali is you know he's the prince he's the he's one of the sons of the king although he is not the heir apparent he is the sort of second in line but that relationship between him and family and the law and his faith and his feelings about the the culture at large make him a really a fascinating character to explore from those different POVs because he's very sympathetic when you're seeing through his eyes and then when you see him through other people's eyes he comes off as very aloof and very difficult and very judgy and he's constantly in a situation where he f- <laughs> he finds that people think he's much harsher than he is like everybody's walking on eggshells around him a lot of the time because they think he's going to like just put people to death or something that was a fun kind of concept to play with him as you're piecing these characters together how did they evolve on the page and what challenges did you run into and trying to get them right to make them work a lot of editing i mean um going back to what you said well it's funny going back to what you said about ali interestingly enough he was the easiest character for me to write and i think i was trying to say something with him because i'm muslim myself and at the point that i was writing this novel i wanted to write a character that felt true at least to my experiences being a Muslim and kind of dealing with some of the fact that sometimes people walk around eggshells, <laughs> walk on eggshells around you and have certain misconceptions. And I knew going into it that that character would play different depending on who read the book. But I wanted to truly, you know, write somebody. I was there at my when I was 18 years old. I had a lot of certainties about religion and what was right and what was wrong. And I wanted to capture that but also capture the fact that he's a kid in many ways in this world. I mean, this is a world where people live to be 300 and sort of that horrifying realization to go that, you know, you've been taught your whole life, your people are right, your family is right. And all of a sudden realizing you're, they're the villains in this story. And how does, what does that do with your, with what you want to do with your life and your own understanding of your place in society and your place quite rightfully in oppressing these people that you think you want to help or these people you think are the enemy. And I think trying to come to terms with that as, you know, he's a person of faith and he's a person that feels he has to do well, I think would just really rock someone's world. Um, And that that would come across his own struggles, but that would also come across, you know, people lash out when they're going through an experience like that. So when he's rude to some of these other characters and they kind of are like, oh, this kid's like a self-righteous bastard. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I wanted it to show that, to sort of show his turmoil. Nahri was fun to write. She was the first character I came up with. And I wanted hers to be, you know, sort of that typical portal fantasy. Oh, it's an orphan who has, you know, magical powers and is brought back to her rightful place. But I really wanted to turn that on its head a bit and examine just really the ways that would deeply, deeply mess someone up. I mean, if you're grown up, you know, you you live on the streets of a city in the 18th century, you have abilities that would rightfully make people terrified of you um, in a society so heavily built on community and family and you have nothing of that. That would really <laughs> interfere with the way you were brought up. That would make you a, you know, a very different person than if you grew up in a loving family or if you grow up, maybe your parents were dead, but you still knew aspects of your identity. You had a cousin, you had an aunt, um, you had you know, a kindly neighbor who looked after you. So I wanted to have that be part of her identity, this sort of suspicious nature, um, the fact that she's kind of is a survivor first. You know, she survives in this world. She's thriving in many ways um, when Dara, the djinn basically kidnaps her and when she's brought to the magical world I wanted her to very much hold on to that Um, that she has difficulty making friends and making acquaintances because she doesn't trust anyone that she continues to ache for the human world that as much as you know the magical world is glitzy and glamorous she can recognize it for what it is and she doesn't feel like she has a place here Um, another aspect I wanted to explore with Nahri is okay you're the orphan who grew up on the streets and all of a sudden you're hailed as this magical heir apparent 
I mean, we talk about imposter syndrome in the writing world. <laughs> that, would, that would be major imposter syndrome. How do you, you're brought into this people, to this religion that you know nothing about, that you're supposed to have a place in. You know, people, when you're a newcomer into a group like that, that's incredibly difficult. You know, you you don't grow up knowing, oh, okay, this is how I greet someone. This is how I do this ritual. This is how people say, say this or celebrate this. We have all these sort of small social cues um, in communities that if you don't have them, it's ve- you'll feel like an outsider for years. And I wanted to show that with Nahri. All these duties of being told, not only are you this incredibly important person for this group, you have a duty to help them, to save them, to take part in these traditions you don't understand. I think that would be a crushing sense of responsibility. I like, too, that as she's thrown into this completely bizarre world to her. She still has all her same impulses. So there's lots of moments where she's looking at the things around her and just going, can I steal that? Oh, no, I, I shouldn't steal that. But I, I want to steal that, you know, that she still has that like that sort of street sensibility about her where when an opportunity presents itself, I should take it. And she has to remind herself that now she's in this place of you know, immense wealth and resource that she's never had before. But she still has that ingrained idea that scarce times are coming. So grab what you can. Yeah. And I think that I think that's how you would feel. I mean, if listen, we we talked, we like to talk about it's fantasy and everything, but the world is a rough place. And if you grow up with nothing, and you know, your your first thought is, when am I going to next eat? When am I going to where am I going to sleep? I don't think those are instincts that she would ever lose. And I wanted to her to have the sense that she kind of feels like at any point, this could all come crumbling down around her. And she doesn't want to be unprepared. Yeah, you have the the other Jin character, Dara, who has a really complicated background that <laughs> even he doesn't quite understand, and and you know, and you're doling out that history for him, uh, you know, slowly through it, uh, and you do have like this burgeoning romance between the characters. So what you have is a near immortal who's been around for a very very long time, and then you know, a young woman who's only just sort of coming into her own. You know, we see this in in other fantasy stories sometimes. You know, this kind of like the ancient but still somewhat adolescent you know man with the younger woman how do you make that work and make it work in a way that that makes the romance feel honest and earned and not creepy i am trying to answer this in a way that doesn't spoil <laughs> the city of red <laughs> and it is almost impossible because that was another i will just say that was another thing i wanted to kind of turn around because i think we have a lot of these stories where, you know, the man who knows everything rides in on the day and he's going to save the save the female character and everything. Whereas I think it's the opposite. Dara has centuries of baggage um, with him, political baggage, his own his own history of what he's done so that, that when they get to Devabad, he's not even capable of handling this new world, this new reality. He is the ultimate person who wants to return to the good old days and is not willing to examine what the good old days actually meant for people. So without entirely spoiling the book, <laughs> trying to think of a way to not say that, because then I can't even discuss Kingdom of Copper <laughs> without... <laughs> It's so hard to talk about sequels, particularly when, you know, they will clearly give away the ending of a previous book if you, you know, give too much information. So yeah, I totally get that. But no, I will say with with Dara, a lot of the trilogy is about the choices people make in sort of the, an authoritarian world. We always like to think we would be the hero. We would be the people, the person who stood up, who rallied. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of people find ways to justify their own actions and still think of themselves as a good person. So with Dara, I really wanted to get into the character of, you know, I knew readers would love him. That's why I wrote him the way I did in the beginning and think of him as always oh, a good man. He's he's nice to Nahri. He's nice to, to the children of his tribe. And then really examine why a good person, someone you think would be good, could be driven to some really horrible acts writing then the romance with Nahri, it's interesting because I tried to go a slightly different way with the romance, which is that it's not so much, you know, it's this love at first sight thing. It's, you know, a lot of female characters in fantasy don't get to just enjoy sexuality. And I think if you were a 20 year old woman who, you know, had flair for life, I say, and you're taken on this adventure with an incredibly attractive man, I think it would be okay if just you wanted to, like, make out with him rather than just just be like, oh, now we're soulmates. You know, especially, I think, sometimes when I see this in, in stories where there's a far, you know, the, the character is, is essentially a child, it's different. But I wanted to write you know, a woman who's coming into her own in so many different ways. She kind of knows what she wants. She's she's an adult. And that's one of the ways that she 
like he's hot. <laughs> why don't we why don't we do something with this? Well, I think you know a, a challenge sometimes, and you I mean you see this all over like in over in the the YA world, but people always want these almost like the first true love idea of like oh like every person that you meet you must be so emotionally invested with and i'm like people sometimes you just make out with someone in real life sometimes you just take a shot i also and this is going to get me on a soapbox that my husband's going to later listen to this and be like wait what but i hate <laughs> i hate the idea of one true love I hate it in fiction. I think that's incredibly depressing. What if your one true love, especially in fantasy, where you know you're you're recreating some you know situations of like you know centuries ago, and your one true love could die at twenty <laughs> like dysentery? But I think people change and people evolve, and you know the sexy person you might have gone for when you were young, maybe ten years later, that's not the type of personality you would be drawn to. And I think that's okay. I think at different points in your life, um, you could make it work. You might. Not entirely spoiling the next book, but there are situations where people marry for other reasons rather than love, for for family reasons, for political reasons, for financial reasons. And I wanted to really examine the idea that Nahari could have many types of love and romance in her life and that that would be OK, that it's OK for for people, especially women, because we like to pigeonhole women that they should either be, you know, spinsters or with their, you know, they're the princess character and they meet the prince when they're like 17 years old and nothing else. Um, I really wanted to examine the idea that she could have lots of different loves and ways of expressing that in her life. I really like that. That's awesome. Another character that I really, really liked in the novel is Ali's father, the king, who is, I would not say is a likable person, but I enjoyed <laughs> all the sequences with him. And I, it was kind of thrown in the fact that like, I read a book recently that had a similar kind of character that I just couldn't connect to because it was very two dimensional. And seeing the king in this one, I felt that you did a really good job of giving a lot of nuance to him. Like there's, there's a lot about him that feels malevolent and things that you can be like, oh, you're the corrupt politician and you wield your power like in ways that feel, uh, you know, very unethical and inappropriate. And he certainly manipulates everybody around him, including his sons. But the sequences where you really see the two of them together, I thought that there were a lot, there was a lot of shades of, of nuance and a character there that I felt like there was a lot more going on on the page and off the page than you often get with characters like that. For whatever reason in my head, I like, you know, you get weird visuals sometimes and I just kept seeing Thanos every time <laughs> like the king would be in a room because he's physically imposing and he's like, yeah. I don't know, like, I mean, I know that's wrong on so many ways, but for whatever reason that he just kept appearing, <laughs> I couldn't shut him off. But I really liked him a lot. When you were approaching that character, was there a, like a lot of historical kind of influence there? Because you talked about earlier where you had like, you know, all these these great stories of these like like these people from the past and how some of them are kind of larger life or from central casting. It's like, is he one of those kinds of characters? He is. And I think it's, it's true to life. And the fact that, I mean, Ghassan is a tyrant. If he were ruling nowadays, we would rightly call him a war criminal and say he needed to be replaced. And I didn't want to back away from that. And unfortunately, our history is full of characters like that. I mean, you will start to read, you'll hear somebody described as this person, the great, and you go to learn about the schools that they founded, all of the, you know, work they did on culture and how they, you know, patronized poets and they, they had all of these acclaim. And then you peel the page back and that usually rests on my like, well, their generals slaughtered this one village or, you know, they had they personally beheaded dissenters. And I really wanted to show some aspect of that. And I think it's a scary thing in some ways to confront is that the villains in real life usually don't think of themselves as villains. You can be a monster and still love your family. You can easily be like, I'm, you know, I'm going to kill a thousand people because it's good for my city. And I really wanted, the struggle with writing Ghassan was showing that, was showing clear-eyed, listen, this man is a tyrant, he's a monster, um, he is, has the blood of thousands on his hands, yet he doesn't conceive of himself as that way. Um, he may twist and manipulate his sons, yet I think if you were to take back and be like, well, why are you doing that? He would righteously believe this is best for them. This is best for my city. So I kind of wanted to delve into the mindset of somebody who rules that way, because a lot of people rule that way. I mean, even people are ruling that way today. And how does a ruler get to that point? And how do you counter that? And how can that be stopped? That's something I really wanted to examine. And it was fun because in Kingdom of Copper, I got to do a lot more of that. 
And again, without spoiler, showing sort of what you become at the end of that is not necessarily this charismatic king who, you know, people like those characters as well. There's a reason we so many people cheer for Cersei in Game of Thrones. Um, (laughs) But at the end, you know, they're not heroes and they're usually driven to a darkness and a bitterness and they don't get that splashy ending. I feel like they've got to be fun to write, too. They are fun to write, though. (laughs) Yes. I mean, especially I, I always loved writing the interactions between Ghassan and Ali um, because, I mean, I'm a parent myself. And though I am not a tyrant where my child is like, you know, not that you know of, of. Yeah, not that I know of. <laughs> um, but I really wanted to just show that aspect of these are t- two such different men and, you know, how Ghassan might feel seeing his son become someone who he must know at some level is going to oppose him. That would wreck you. Um, you know, you're if you're this, you know, king who squashes all dissent, what do you do when, you know, your baby, especially as Ali is his youngest, is growing up and you're just watching this threat manifest before you? You know, how do you handle that situation? There's a scene where Kassan catches Ali in a lie, in a very big lie. And I, it might be my favorite scene in the book because it's a master stroke of a powerful tyrant parent using a grave mistake on his child's part against him in a way that the the son could not have seen coming and you know that will change his life you know irrevocably it's such a power move like i could kill you for what you've done but instead i'm going to you know use it to get what i want out of you and i, I loved everything about the text and i can't talk much more about it without giving yeah. too much away I will say that was my favorite chapter to write. <laughs> it shows. I mean, that scene really stood out to me. And I just remember finishing it up and feeling like, oh, my gosh, I would love to like, you know, I don't, I don't beg for every book to be made into a series or whatever. But like, I could so see that being one of those <laughs> great like HBO series kind of Game of Thrones, like, you know, kind of moments like it really sings like that. And the dialogue is so good in that sequence. So I really dig that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I want to step over to some craft elements as far as world building and outlining and how you put all this together. Because, I mean, it should be said, these are complex novels and there's a lot of mythology, there's a lot of history, uh, and there's just a lot going on in general. How did you handle that? Like, are, are you a comprehensive outliner? Do you pant some of it? Like some mix of, you know, of the two? Like, what's your system? I would say I have a very good system for keeping all of my world building in track. You know, I have my own sort of guidebook that I've written of this happened then, this happened then, these are the groups, this is a map, blah, blah, blah. When it comes to actually writing the book, I don't really have a system. (laughs) Um, I'm a terrible outliner. I'm like, you know, it's it's interesting because The City of Brass was the first book I ever wrote. I mean, I dabbled in some fan fiction when I was in high school and like tried to be like, oh, I would like to write a book. Let me try to write a short story. But The City Brass is it. So and then The Kingdom of Copper, of course, is the second book I've written in my life. So I'm still kind of finding out this process myself. And what seems to be working for me, at least I hope so, um, because I'm on the third book, is I'll have, you know, a general, I would like, I know what I want to happen at the end. And I tend to know I want these 12 things to happen, a general idea of the story. And then I am far more of a pantser as I actually write. I'll start out to write this chapter. I want A to happen at the end and I'll get halfway through and I'll be like, wow, what if this happened? And this goes off in an entirely different direction, um, but it'll be a better direction. And I usually just go with it. So my process is kind of to just draft lightly and then go back and then draft lightly and go back and just kind of tighten everything up as I go along um, rather than write this whole story and then kind of work from that. I like to kind of, you know, stare at my sections and examine them and turn them over and see what, what needs to be fixed and what needs to, you know, be brought up to a better level before I move on. Did you find that writing the sequel was easier or more difficult or just a completely different kind of challenge from writing the first one? Uh, Writing the sequel actually made me have a nervous breakdown. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, okay. It was was a very different experience, which I like to be honest about because I don't think necessarily in publishing we're always really honest about some of the stress in writing. You know, The City of Brass was something I did on the side. It was pleasurable. I wrote it for like seven years. I mean, it was just something I worked on on the side. Then I shared with my writer friends. It was very much, I mean, I wanted to get it published at a certain point. It was the dream, but it was a dream. I really didn't think any of this would happen. 
And then, so it, it happens. And then Kingdom of Copper was, wait, I have to write a book? I don't know how to write a book. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know how to work on a project on the side for years. But to sit down and, and actually just do this in, in the space of a year was incredibly stressful. Um, and it was a huge learning process of, you know, when to go with your gut versus when to go with what you want on the paper, um, when to let certain ideas go. A lot of my hangups were trying to fix things in that I'd wanted to put in two years ago. And it was incredibly stressful. And I think publishing is a hard business. Um, I And I made most of my mistakes by doing everything wrong that they tell you not to do, like reading reviews and then trying to write the second book, um, you know, <laughs> following all of these these things. And it was a learning process. And I'm, I'm glad I'm through it. And I did it. And I feel far more confident, you know, that now that I'm in the third book, but it was an incredibly stressful experience. I've been told uh, by several authors that I've talked to, particularly ones that have had like a breakout debut novel, that they're like, it's a blessing and a curse to come out of the gate as hard as that, because then, you know, your sophomore effort has to live up. And like you said, you have your whole life to write the first book yeah. and then eight to 12 months to write the second one. Uh, and suddenly it's this whole wave of being challenged in, in ways you wouldn't think of, because I mean, a lot of people should think, oh, well, you know, a sequel, you've already developed the world you already know the characters you know you should be you know good to go and i'm sure a lot of that is in play that you know you have a lot of that groundwork done but like you said you said you almost sound like a nervous breakdown in approaching it because it's it's an emotionally taxing kind of thing what were your coping mechanisms then during that coping mechanisms yeah. <laughs> i did not have them <laughs> no i mean <laughs> I think at a certain point, and this is something I recommend to people who find themselves in the same boat, is sometimes at a certain point, you just need to get an internet block on Amazon, on Goodreads, on the, on the actual search pages for your own things. If you feel like you can't stop yourself, find ways to stop yourself. Ask people to, to change your passwords on Twitter or social media, because I think a lot of debut authors are on that. Um, sometimes you just need a break. And to just be honest with you know your agent, with other writers you're working with, with your editor, and just know your own limits and just kind of realize that as much as everyone says, oh, the second book is going to break you, it really shouldn't. And there are times where I think in this field, we need to stop and institute some, you know, better mental health checks for ourselves. Definitely. Are you feeling any better as you work on the third book? I'm feeling 100% better. I mean, a lot of it was the second book got to a certain point where I knew I couldn't continue like this. And then I had a health scare, which really sort of, I'm fine now. Um, but it really was just kind of like a wake up call for myself. Like, wait a second, I love these books. I love writing and I love reading and interacting with fans. But you know, at a certain point, it's a job and it's not my health and it's not my family. And it was kind of taking a step back and being like, you know, I, I'll, I'll work on it. And I'm blessed to be given this opportunity, but it's not worth, you know, breaking down again. And it's been good too, and I'll be honest that a lot of the feed I've gotten a lot of feedback for the second book, and it's better than the first in many ways. So I'm feeling confident about that. You know, I'm excited. I'm very excited to to launch it and see what people think. And I'm finding ways to find fun in writing again, and I'm enjoying the third book. So I really am in a, a far better place. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. And nothing yes. puts things into perspective like a hospital stay or something yes. like that. So yes, particularly unexpected ones. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> Along with the the craft of writing is the tools of writing what software do you use and then beyond that are you a pen and paper kind of person you know like what what are your methodologies there I use Microsoft Word. I have tried Scrivener. I've tried other things. But for whatever reason, I keep going back to Microsoft Word, buggy Microsoft Word on my falling apart computer. <laughs> <laughs> for whatever reason, be my, my way of going about it. But I do like for when I when I reread and I do a lot of rereads and editing and revising as I go along, which everyone says, you know, you shouldn't do, but it just seems to be my method. Um, at that point, I will usually and I recommend this to people. Um, if you can download it as a PDF and put it on a Kindle and kind of read it like you're reading an ebook. And then I take handwritten notes um, on the side of that for whatever reason, it seems to just let me have like a slightly fresher perspective than just working and editing straight into into word. When you do things by hand, it just fires a different part of your brain. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. Are you one of those people that's like, that's got dedicated notebooks and a specific kind that you get and like just the pens you like, or are you like whatever is at hand gets the job done? I like legal pads, um, which might only just be because when I started writing, my in-laws brought over like an entire case of them. I don't know why <laughs> <laughs> we, have enough, we have enough legal pads to survive like 
50 years. So I'll usually just use that. And I, it seems easier for me, but it's not fancy at all. I mean, like I have, I have terrible handwriting. I'm working on these old like discount pads with my like normal pens and it's, it's fine. It gets the job done. Well, I think there's, there's something nice about that uh, because the, you, you don't get precious about a legal pad. You know, it's just a tool <laughs> versus, I mean, like, I mean, I have umpteen zillion journals and in various states of just chock full of just scribbles to like trying to do fancy bullet journals or stuff like that. And there's an author I follow on Instagram who will post her bullet journals and they're gorgeous. I mean, they're absolutely beautiful. The things that she doesn't, and she's an illustrator too. So I get it. But I keep looking at it and being like, did you write today or did you just like use <laughs> five different pens to make this beautiful page? I mean, it looks incredible. And I, I mean, aesthetically, it's very pleasing, but like. How did you find time to work after you did all of that? And yeah, I get lost in that sometimes. Yeah. I mean, people have very different organizational skills. And I mean, mine is kind of just barely hanging in there. It's like, <laughs> I just, I'm, even, you know, it's funny because I, I was going through some old notes the other day and throwing them out. And my husband was horrified. He's like, why are you throwing out your notes? He's like, you might want to look at them one day. Or he's like, oh, people might want to look at them one day, which one I was like, that's ridiculous. That's never going to happen. And I don't want them. I don't want anyone to look at them like you couldn't even read them. I have probably some of the worst handwriting you've ever seen in your life. So, nope, into the recycling. <laughs> <laughs> I both respect that and feel horrified at the same time. So I, <laughs> I get both uh, angles on that one. I know. Like, you know, as somebody who loves history, I'm like, you don't throw out your notes. <laughs> like, but uh, they're cluttering up my, I have a small New York City apartment. I got to go. <laughs> oh, that, that I understand entirely. Beyond all of that stuff, then, when you do have time away from, from the writing process and, and everything else, what other media are you feeding your writer brain with? TV, other books, film, music, podcasts, anything. What, what do you turn to? I'm actually, it's funny because as much as I write fantasy now, I started out as more of a science fiction fan. Um, and still, you know, I'm, when I'm watching shows and everything, I mean, I can't wait for The Expanse and for the new Star Trek and everything to come back out. Those are my sort of go-tos. Um, so I like a lot of science fiction. And I think for whatever reason, I still continue to consume a lot of that, sometimes more than fantasy. Um, I try to keep up. I, You know, I, I love the genre still. And I think there's such incredible work coming out, especially by a lot of newer authors um, and just new stuff in the genre. There's just like fresh ideas and fresh takes on, on power and race and gender. And it's just, it's really a great time to be reading fantasy right now. So I have that. And then I still keep up with my history. I mean, easily I, I try to do, okay, a third of reading is for pleasure. A third of reading is genre stuff, publishing, you know, reading this person because I'm having an event. And then a third is still, you know, me going back to my, oh, there's a new translation of like, you know, some like sat satirist from like Cairo in the 15th century. And I, I love it. That that more than anything continues to give me fresh ideas and, and fresh takes on, on certain aspects of, of the civilization. And, oh, Oh, wow, I read this folk tale. What could you do if you switched it up and looking looking at it from like a woman's perspective or like from the perspective of the magical being in it? I still find most of my fuel in in reading history. That's a well that keeps on giving. And it's I think, it, like you said, sometimes the stuff that happens, you know, they get the, the truth is stranger than fiction cliche, but it, it's there for a reason, because sometimes yeah. <laughs> when you dig below the basic surface of things, you find out that humans are deeply, deeply effed up. And uh, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot to mine from those things. There is. I mean, I, I always joke, I'm like, the stories that I read about and the folktales people came up with a thousand years ago are still far more zany and wild and out there than anything I could come up with. So it's fun. I mean, it, it very much is an idea, like you said, that humans are just, wow, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot to go with that. To wrap up, uh, there was something I saw going around on Twitter because, you know, people get fired up about things, which was just writer rooms like people having writer rooms or like having a dedicated space, which feels very extravagant to, I think, people who live like probably like, like in a New York apartment where maybe you don't have those yeah. spaces versus where like I'm in St. Louis and, you know, we have a four bedroom house and I have, you know, a podcast studio room and mm -hmm. an office, you know, because you can do that here because there's sprawl and it doesn't cost as much. Uh, <laughs> what's your space like? What do you populate it with? What helps you get into the writer mood? <laughs> Um, I have a broken desk I found at a garage sale a couple of years ago, <laughs> but that I really like 
because it's got I'm very like picky about my like I, I have some some lower back problems so I'm always trying to find a desk that's the right height for my chair so I'm very particular to this desk I can't even use the drawers anymore <laughs> they're falling out <laughs> but I like it has a good a good wide surface to sort of spread notes and everything um it's full of stickers that my five-year-old daughter has put on and it's just smack in our living room so that I can watch her play and do work and it's nothing special at all I mean I try to put some of like the fan art and stuff that people have sent I printed out and put it on there but it is not a writing room and I'm hoping one day you know when we move I'll be able to have something a little bit more dedicated but it's important it gets the work done <laughs> so that's what the tool has to do and hopefully you'll still wherever you go like later on you'll keep that funky desk and all those stickers and stuff because that sounds yeah. way too fun <laughs> Where should uh, people be following you and your work to keep up with your stuff? Where are you at online? So I have my website, which is essaychakraborty.com, just my name. Um, and I have, you know, a lot of a lot there. I actually have a guide to the book, which is sort of helpful to, for people who are reading along. And I have you can sign up for my newsletter there. I keep I update events and everything through there. Online, I'm really only at Twitter. I'm at S.A. Chakra Books. So S.A. C.H.A. K-R-A-B-O-O-K-S. Um, and I'm pretty active on Twitter. I like to do a lot of sort of pop history elements and share a lot from the areas I study and the, t the times that I study. And I also update a lot of book stuff on there. Well, awesome. The City of Brass is available now. Uh, the Kingdom of Copper comes out January 22nd. It's great stuff. I hope that people will be reading it because uh, these are awesome worlds and you're an, a great addition to the voices in fantasy. So um, hopefully they will go and check it out. So uh, Shannon, thank you so much for joining me on Fictitious. Thank you for having me. The home for all things fictitious, including every episode and review, is fictitiouspodcast.com. You can find the show on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Fictitious Pod, and you can chat with me directly on Twitter where I'm at Adrian Buskey. Subscribe to Fictitious on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify so you don't miss all of my upcoming interviews and reviews, and be sure to check out the previous author interviews exploring the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. I'm Adrian Buskey. Thanks for listening to Fictitious.